I am so excited to announce our next speaker. Kelsey Sanchez is a wonderful example for all of us. She's the youth pastor here at Covenant Church and recently celebrated her first year of marriage to George Sanchez. We know this next message is going to be one that is powerful and special. Help me give Kelsey a big welcome as she comes to the stage. Before I start, um, I would like to give Lexi another round of applause. That was beautiful. That is my sister-in-law, by the way. I love her very much. (laughs) Okay. So, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Kelsey. I know you already saw it on the screen. Um, But me and my husband are the youth pastors here, along with Jaheim. I think he's in the back. Can you raise your hand over there? We can't do anything without him. He is so awesome. He is so awesome. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a lot more people to raise teenagers. (laughs) Um, So if if y'all will go ahead and put the first picture on the board. This is my husband. We have been married for just a little over a year. He is my very best friend, and he completes me in every way. Uh, He is the goofy side of me. He is the fun side of me. I know that makes me sound really boring, but (laughs) but he he is everything that I'm not, and he completes me in every way, and I'm so honored to be covered by him. I'm so honored to serve with you. I love you very, very much. So we don't have any kids. But you can show the next two pictures. This is Josie. She is our first baby. (laughs) She is about three years old, and she is so, so sweet. Now you can show the next one. (laughs) Aww. (laughs) Well, this is Luna, and Sharon gave us Luna about almost a year ago, and she is sweet, but she is very hyper. (laughs) And I don't have kids, but I do feel like I clean up just about as much messes as moms do. Well, um, I'm going to start out with just a little prayer first, and then I'll get started, okay? So everybody will bow your heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for every single lady that is here that you have divinely placed here. Father, we know that this is going to be a time where we can encounter your spirit, where we can seek you more, and you're going to meet us, just like Lexi said, you're going to meet us exactly where we're at. So, Lord, we praise you right now. We thank you in advance for everything that you are going to do and the work that you are going to start and the work that you are going to complete. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so how I came to Covenant Church... I was kind of born here. Um, I've been going here since I was a baby, <laughs> and um, I didn't really have didn't really have a relationship with the Lord. I probably didn't really get to know the Lord until a few years ago. I'm 26 right now, my early 20s, um, when I really started to develop a relationship with Him. And over the years, um, I got to watch people come in and come out and come in and come out. And I watched people experience the presence of God for the first time. I watched God perform perform miracles and signs and wonders for other people. I watched marriages be restored. I watched people go from literally broken to completely whole. And I witnessed the miraculous power of God. But I wasn't experiencing it wasn't experiencing it for myself. I wasn't experiencing it in my life. And I thought I knew God. But what I realized was I knew the deluded version of God. The version that I had been told by my Sunday school teachers, that my parents had taught me. And you see, over time, we tend to take God for granted. Has anybody ever seen a scary movie in here? You can admit it. I don't watch them anymore, but you can admit it if you have. (laughs) So when I was a teenager, I'd watch scary movies. Well, you know, the first time that you see a scary movie, 
you jump. Every time something pops out at you, you jump, you get scared. Um, and you know that there's always a girl, and the guy is, like, going two miles behind her, walking two miles an hour, but she's still going to run upstairs into her bedroom in the closet, not lock the door, instead of going out the front door like a normal person. <laughs> and so the first time you watch the movie, it's scary, right? The second time you watch the movie, uh, you're still a little scared. You know, you still jump a little bit. About the third and fourth time you watch the movie, mm, I've already seen that. Mm, I already know what's going to happen. And you become desensitized. And that's what I did in my relationship with God. I came in and out of these doors every Sunday, every Wednesday. And mm, I saw that. Mm, yeah, that's cool. But I was so desensitized to God's spirit. The God that I knew was not the God from the Old Testament that parted the Red Seas, that rained manna from the skies. He wasn't the Jesus that Lexi talked about that uh, cast demons out of people, that healed the blind. Sorry, y'all lost my place. I really did lose my place. So instead, the God that I knew was sat on the shelf with all the other stories that I had been told as a kid. He sat up there with Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. And, um, sorry, babe, I'm going to kind of throw you under the bus, but, uh, <laughs> My husband loves Justin Bieber, okay? You can go. <laughs> you can go up to him and ask him any question about Justin Bieber. He knows his middle name. He knows when he was born. He knows every song that was not popular, and I know because I've tested this theory, I just would play a song, he could sing it. The ones I didn't even know about. I didn't even know existed. He knows his favorite color. He knows everything about Justin Bieber. But how many of you know it's so different to know, to know of somebody versus knowing somebody? Okay, and I thought that I knew God, but really I just knew of him. I knew what religion had taught me to see. I knew that I knew the stories and I knew the verses, but I did not know God. So if we can go ahead and play the video. powerful, isn't it? So beautiful. So I'm going to begin reading this story to you. It's going to be, if you want to read along with me, it's going to be in Matthew. I'm reading verses, uh, it's chapter 14, verses 20 through, through, 22 through 29. Okay. All right. So it says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. 
Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and he came towards Jesus. So the video that I showed you was the completion of that story. We know that obviously Peter got distracted. He began to sink. And Jesus reached out his hand for him. I showed you this video for two reasons. The first reason, I wanted you to see how intimate of a relationship that Peter had with Jesus. Did you hear him say, don't let me go? Don't let me go. Jesus met him where he was at, and he reached out his hand to him. And he pulled him up out of that water. The second reason that I showed you this video is because sometimes we can be guilty of reading a story in the Bible like it's a story, like it's a children's book, okay? But this really happens. This was a real event, okay? So I'm going to go back. I want to go back to the conversation that I just read about that Peter and Jesus originally had. So it says right here, it says um, in verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. So I want to point something out to you. They didn't know it was Jesus. All they knew was they were on water, in open water. The waves were crashing against their boat. The safest place that they had was in that boat together. Because if they stepped out of that water, they could drown they could be taken under by a current. It was literally a lifeboat for them, okay? Um, and then I want to go down to where Jesus replied. It said, Jesus immediately said to them. He didn't wait to respond to them. He didn't allow them to sit in their fear and sit alone in their fear. He immediately came to their rescue. Yeah. He immediately responded to them, and he said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. But let me tell you what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say his name. He never said, take courage, it is I, Jesus. And he never said, take courage, it is I, your Lord. He said, take courage, it is I. Okay, well, they didn't know who was walking towards them. They couldn't see. So I could be anybody, right? Um, but he knew he knew the kind of relationship that he had with his disciples. They had left everything. They left their jobs, their livelihood. They left their families, their wives, their children. They left everything just to follow Jesus, just to have a relationship with Jesus. So they knew him on an intimate level that nobody else knew him. And Jesus knew how strong that relationship was. And that's why he never had to say his name. Because he knew as soon as he spoke... His disciples were going to know his voice. He knew his disciples were going to know exactly who was speaking to him. Because here's what it says. Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And the, ne the very next verse says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, he identified Jesus. Jesus never identified himself. So Peter, as soon as he heard Jesus' voice, he said, that's my God. I know who that voice is. I recognize that voice, and that is a voice that I can trust. Do you think that Peter would have ever stepped out on that water, knowing he could lose his life, knowing um, that he could drown, if he wasn't sure that he was sure that he was sure that he knew who he was talking to? That he knew whose voice that was. Because that's what happens when you know your heavenly father. When he speaks, you listen. When he speaks, you respond. You know who is speaking to you when you have a close relationship with Jesus Christ. It works the same way with an infant. Okay? I read um, an article uh, from Yale, from a study in Yale, and they said that a baby recognizes their mother's voice as early as the third trimester. So while it's still in the womb with you, it is already hearing your voice and beginning to recognize your voice. 
And then it's not until after the infant is born that they begin to recognize the voices of other people, okay? So we know that an infant doesn't have the same comprehension that we have. We know that an infant can't comprehend that this is my mom. We, they, they can't identify this is my mom, and this is my dad, and this is my cousin, and this is my grandparent. But what they do know is a familiar voice, right? A voice that they know because of the connection that they have to their mother. A voice that brings comfort. When they start crying and they know, I know whenever I cry and I hear that voice, that's the voice that I hear right before they pick me up. They know because of the connection that they have with their mother. So here's what I want to ask you this morning. If Jesus walked in here dressed like the rest of us, because when he was robed in flesh, right, he looked like everybody else. He dressed like everybody else. If Jesus walked in here, dressed like us, would you be able to recognize him? Would you know when he was speaking to you? Do you, um, do you have a close and intimate relationship with Jesus? Or have you settled for just being an acquaintance? Is your relationship with God just casual? Or let me ask you this, because this is where I found myself. Have you formed a relationship with God out of duty or obligation? If you'll go ahead and show the next picture. Okay. These two perfumes are made by Burberry. Where's Mandy at? Yeah, raise your, your hand, girl. <laughs> She wears this perfume, and I think she's gotten, like, I don't know how many ladies to buy it because it smells so good on her. <laughs> so um, these two perfumes are made by Burberry. They're called, um, it's Her. That's the collection. Um, and uh, there is a difference between these two, per two perfumes. They're not the same, okay? They look very similar. Let's talk about their similarities, okay? They're in the very similar bottle, right? The only difference is, like, their, their cap. The, um, the perfume that's in them looks about the same color, right? Um, the same amount, these are both the same size bottles. They both, um, they both hold 100 milliliters. So they look very similar, okay? Let's talk about the differences, okay? And this is something that you probably wouldn't know because I didn't include it on the picture, but the difference is, is one of these perfumes costs more. Can you tell which one? Kind of hard, right? And one of these perfumes is more potent and more concentrated than the other, okay? So I'm going to try to pronounce this. It's, in, it's like French. Um, <laughs> I looked this up on YouTube, and I feel like I've already forgotten how to say it. So y'all give me some grace. It's Eau de Toilette perfume. We're in East Texas, so we're going to call it toilet perfume, Okay. <laughs> And then there is the Eau de Parfum perfume. We're just going to call that perfume, okay? That's just easy. We have the toilet perfume. We have the regular perfume, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> and the only reason I know the difference between the two is because I had to write it down, but you can't really see the difference between the two. So, the toilet perfume is on the left side, and it, um, it's the white cap, okay? So, uh, the white cap is more diluted, Okay, uh, it, it has more of an alcohol content. There's more alcohol in it than there is actual perfume. Okay, more than there is more perfume oil. And then the one on the right is the regular perfume. Okay, it is more concentrated. It has more perfume oil in it. Okay, it's not as diluted. So this is what we're going to represent here is the diluted version on the right side, which is the, right, the, the white cap. It's the toilet perfume. By the way, it's also translated to English toilet water. So if you're buying this perfume, you're wearing toilet water. <laughs> so the right side, the diluted version, is going to represent religion. Okay? The, uh, or it's the left side, the left side, the white cap. Okay? The right side, which is the pink cap, is going to represent relationship. Okay, so religion is the diluted version. Relationship is the more potent version. And from the outside, they look the same. You know, if you, if you put them on the counter in front of me, I would not be able to tell you which is which. 
I would have no idea, right? Because from an outside perspective, walking with God, and if you're being bound by religion, it looks almost the same as a relationship. But another difference that I didn't tell you is there's also a difference in how long they last, okay? So religion leaves you feeling satisfied, but it doesn't leave you feeling saturated, okay? Relationship, you are drenched. You have the Spirit of the Lord going before you and moving in you. And so I want you to understand is what I'm not doing, I'm not preaching against church. We need to gather together. We need to be able to pray for each other. We need to be able to encourage each other. But what I am preaching against very heavily is the spirit of religion. Okay? Because it was, I guess, not that long ago, actually. Um, I sat over here on the left side on the second pew for as long as I can remember. And uh, as about a, what, 15, 17-year-old girl, I was coming faithfully. I was going to youth when I was supposed to. And then when I became an adult, I was coming upstairs like I was supposed to. But, but that's all it was. I was just coming because I was supposed to come. But I was broken. I was absolutely just decaying on the inside. I was dead. And it's the same way as when Peter was out walking on the water. You know, whenever he was looking at Jesus, he was perfectly fine. But then whenever he looked to his left and he looked to his right, all of a sudden he began to sink. And that's what religion was for me because I was looking at religion to be the filler for God. I expected religion to fulfill the only place where a true connection could take place, the only place where God could come in. I was once bound by obligation, but I was completely set free by the grace and the love of God. This is going to be Matthew. It's not going to be on the board, but I'm going to read it to you. It's Matthew 5 and 17. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, for I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. Jesus met the requirement of the law because he knew that you could never fulfill it. He knew that he had to die on a cross and he had to take your place not only just to save you and not only just to redeem you, but so that he could close that gap that has been separating you from your heavenly father. To bring you unto him so that you could know him better. So that you could have a relationship with him. So that whenever he speaks, you can respond. So that whenever he speaks, peace comes over you. So that whenever he speaks, you feel like this void that has just been gaping open. And you felt so crushed and so broken. And God has come in and he has restored it. Sorry. I didn't expect to get emotional. It was so that you could taste and so that you could see that the Lord is good. But it's one thing for you to settle because you have no other choice. But it's a completely another thing to settle when you know, when you know that you know that there's another choice. And let me tell you what, Jesus is the other choice. A relationship with your heavenly father is the other choice. You do not have to leave here bound. You do not have to leave here the same way that whenever you walked in, you can walk out free. You can walk out whole. You can walk out restored. Refuse to settle. Do not settle. Do not come in here and walk out the same. Refuse to settle. If I can have the fat time team come up.
the baskets. Um, if I can get half of you, this half is good. Okay, this half of you, um, we're gonna do something. So I don't have perfume for you, but we do have something very, very special for you. We have some anointing oil um, that is very not diluted. <laughs> it's not the toilet version. It is very, very potent with, with frankincense. And we have that as a gift for you today so that whenever you go home, you can anoint your house. When you go home and you need to pray over your child because he or she is sick, you can pray over them and you can command that infirmity to leave. This is for you to take as a gift from us to you. And so I'm going to have this side of the fight time team pass out um, pass out these bags and it's going to have anointing oil. And let me tell you what you're doing when you're accepting it. This is a choice. Just like you refusing to settle and choosing God is a choice. It's saying, I don't want to go back to just sitting on the pew. I don't want to just go back to my old life, but I want to come out of here renewed and restored. And I want to have a relationship with God. That's what you're saying whenever you come here and you pick up this um, anointing oil. And then I'm going to have this other half of the fight time team. If you, um, if you feel like you don't, you've been stuck and you need a move of God in your life, if you need an encounter with the Lord, if you don't know where to start, this is what this half is for. They're going to pray over you. And then after they pray over you, you're welcome to go get a gift. You don't have to get prayed for if you don't want to. But let me tell you what, we are here. This is not for us. This is so that the glory of God can be revealed and can be poured out. This is for you guys. God showed up here for each and every single one of you. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for meeting us here. Father, we thank you for the encounters that have already happened. And we thank you for the encounters that we're going to continue to have at this conference. Lord, have your way. I'm stepping out of the way right now so that you can come in and you can fill us with your spirit so that you can make us whole, so that you can help us be, walk in our freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. I turn this over to the praise team. Fresh fire.